Schönen guten Abend, ja, herzlich willkommen im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums zu der zweiten Late-Night-Vorstellung, die wir, also das Filmkollektiv Frankfurt, das Hofbaukommando und ähm, das Deutsche Filmmuseum zusammen bestreiten. Wir hatten gestern schon die Vorstellung von äh, Lujuria Tropical, Tropische Sinnlichkeit, und heute ist die zweite Vorstellung, und zwar äh, Fievre von Armando Von aus dem Jahre 1972. Ja, ich äh, kann sagen, dass, es, dass ich äh, euch sehr beglückwünsche zu der Entscheidung, heute Abend hier zu sein, denn es wird ein Film, dem der wirklich vieles sprengt, was man in seiner Vorstellung vom Kino weiß. Es wird, ja, also ich bin, bin sehr, sehr gespannt. Ich ähm, habe den Film jetzt vorher schon gesehen, weil wir ihn untertiteln mussten. Ich muss, muss auch noch, äh, mich auch noch unbedingt danken an Annette Brauerhoch und José für die Hilfe bei der Erstellung der Untertitel. Also vielen herzlichen Dank. Vielen. Aber also es ist eine Deutschlandpremiere, der Film läuft zum ersten Mal in Deutschland und ähm, ja, offensichtlich zum ersten Mal überhaupt wurden Untertitel erstellt. Ich möchte auch noch kurz darauf hinweisen, dass es morgen ähm, den dritten und letzten Tag in der Armando Von Retro äh, Hommage gesagt gibt mit, mit diesem Film. Er läuft morgen Abend um 9 Uhr. Dann äh, von äh, Desnuda, Naked auf Deutsch. Einer von drei Filmen von Armando Von, die damals in Deutschland rauskamen. Ja, und ich möchte noch darauf hinweisen, dass ähm, die Kopie, die wir jetzt sehen werden, von Fievre aus der Filmotheca de Catalunya stammt, aus Barcelona. Ähm, Andreas Beilharz vom Deutschen Filmmuseum hat, ja, also hat es dann ermöglicht, dass äh, die, diese Ausleihe stattfinden kon konnte, denn ja, woanders wäre es nicht gegangen. Es ist eine Kopie, die nur an vier Kinos verliehen wird, weil es eine Unikatskopie ist. In Argentinien gibt es ähm, keine zugängliche, spielbare Kopie, sagen wir so. Also das Inka hat keine Kopie, die spielbar ist. Und ja, ich möchte auch noch darauf hinweisen, es ist eine zeitgenössische Kopie, also aus dem, äh, nicht, nicht von 72, sondern der Film kam, warum er in Barcelona archiviert ist, der Film kam in Spanien raus. Äh, in Argentinien ist er 72 rausgekommen, in Spanien 1979, nach dem Tod von Franco, ein paar Jahre, und äh, genau, und da lief er in einer längeren Fassung, also in, äh, die argentinischen Fassungen sind wohl knapp an 70 Minuten und die Fassung jetzt ist volle, exzessive 85 Minuten lang. Also so lang, wie der Film auch äh, entstanden ist. Und die Kopie ist aber rotstichig, das möchte ich noch sagen. Wir wissen jetzt nicht genau, in welchem Ausmaß, weil die äh, Bilder, die wir von der Digitalisierung haben, sahen schon gut rot aus, aber bei der Projektion ist es manchmal, äh, verändert sich das. Ähm, ich möchte auch noch herzlichen Dank sagen an Juan Carlos Paz Delgado, der die Live-Untertitelung macht, und an Christian Appel für die Vorführung. Yes, and uh, now I will check. Uh, yeah, doch, doch, eine Sache möchte ich noch uh, vorlesen, und zwar für die, die das ähm, Programmheft nicht gelesen haben oder den Flyer nicht gelesen haben, noch ein Zitat von Hans Schifferle, das ich unbedingt noch vorlesen möchte, bevor wir diesen Film sehen. Und zwar, ähm, genau, äh, elementar und naiv hebt Armando Vos erotisches Melodram, das ist jetzt auf einen anderen Film bezogen. Ähm, genau, also ein, oder ja, vor allem das Zitat, bürgerliche Geschmacksvorstellungen muss man vergessen und auch den Selbstschutz ablegen, Gefühlsdarstellungen nur ironisch zu betrachten. Das ist noch äh, vorgeschickt in den schönen Worten von Hans Schifferle. Now I will change into English, because I have the pleasure and great honor of inviting uh, a friend, also a wonderful film critic and a wonderful poet and a great uh, analyst of films, Gabriela Trujillo from La Cinematique Française in Paris. I think she's probably one of the very few per persons in um, Europe, maybe even in some sense worldwide, for being a foremost specialist of uh, Latin American cinema. So uh, Gabriela wrote her thesis with uh, Nicole Brenes in, in Paris on Latin American avant-garde. And for this thesis, she uh, well, she also came up upon uh, Armando Bon because she made an extremely profound research. She told me today that her thesis is 800 pages on um, Latin American avant-garde. So, and Gabriela, yes, um, um, uh, she's uh, probably one of the yeah, few persons who really can speak very profoundly about uh, Armando Bo and give us insights uh, into a filmmaker who, to whom, about whom it's difficult to know more unless you speak or can read Spanish. So, in that sense, yeah, I'm very much looking forward. I'm really happy that you're here, Gabriela, and warm welcome to Gabriela Trujillo. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, thank you, Gary. I'm sorry I don't speak German. That's really awful. But um, thank you all for being here. I'll try to make it short because I know 
that you are really, really waiting for for this film, and I think you won't be disappointed. You know that uh, Juan Domingo Perón, the Argentinian president, once said that Isabel Sarli was uh, worth any uh, diplomats in the world, that she was the best message that Argentina could send to the world. So I hope you enjoy also the the uh, this diplomatic message um, today. The... Um, The, the, the fact that, uh, well, Gary and I talked about Armando Bo a few months ago in, 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 in Paris. I work at the Cinematic Francaise, and I'm very happy that this finally happened. And I think we need to applaud Gary because he made... <laughs> great job and you all the whole team and thank you for for having me here so i'm going to try to be very brief about 20 years of career and almost um let's say 27 films that armando bo and isabel sarli made together so these films at the times they were made so in 1960s and 1970s they were famous worldwide let's say uh, very much in latin america uh, considerable success in the United States and was also some countries in which the success was amazing, like India or China, for example. So Isabel Sarli was this sort of cult uh, star and pinup that uh, uh, made a whole generation of people a dream. So my question when I came to study and to watch these films was how could I understand I know this is not my thesis, I know, but um, how could I understand the, the fairly subversive uh, and yet popular elements in his films? Because uh, Armando Bo always defended the fact that he made popular films. He was not into the elite. He was really making um, films for everyone. And that's why the, um, the weight of the censorship was so irrational uh, regarding his, his works. So Armando Bo comes from classic Argentinian cinema. Um, just to give you a few elements, he was a major actor in the 1940s, so everyone knew his face. When you see the films, um, some of you can now recognize him when he appears in the film, when he was the only one, uh, even if he was playing an anonymous part in the film. Um, yeah. Do you, can you hear me here? Yes. Is it better? Okay. I'll try. Is that better? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Armando Bo, uh, everyone who saw the films, it still sounds right. I'm sorry. Maybe here? Because <laughs> I don't have a low, vo uh, a high voice. Um, so, Everyone could recognize him, you know, when he appears, when even when he's uh, like in Embrujada yesterday, when he's wearing a wig and fake elements, uh, everyone could recognize him. And that gave this very personal touch to uh, the films. He was not only an actor, but um, he also was producing films even before he became the director that you are discovering this weekend. In 1956, and that's where the versions are different, uh, he met Isabel Sarli in a TV show. Isabel Sarli was at the time Miss Argentina, so a beauty queen who had never... Uh, she, she, was, she appeared in some advertisements, but uh, she had never played in film before. The version I had is that he tried to convince her to act in a film he was preparing, this super production that we saw this afternoon, El Treno Entre las Hojas. Now, other versions are that uh, someone convinced Armando Bo to hire her as an actress, even though she, hadn't, uh, she, she had not any experience. The, you know the story probably of this first, I don't know if you said it earlier today, but El Trueno Entre las Hojas was the first uh, female frontal nude in Latin American cinema. So that's why everyone would go and see this film, um, independently of its other qualities, because it was presented as a very ambitious project, an adaptation uh, made by a major writer, Augusto Roabastos, 
And um, that this is the film when she became La Coca. She was known as La Coca Sarli and uh, Coca because some say she loved Coca-Cola and others say because of the voluptuous uh, uh, figure of her body that she looked like a Coca-Cola bottle. Um, so La Coca Sarli will be uh, an idol uh, during the 1960s and 70s. And what you are seeing this weekend and other films, believe me, are sometimes the same to me, are um, these films are infinite variations of the same subject. At the center, you have a female and she is really uh, the, the, the center of the male gaze of the desire that sometime, uh, sometimes can be, uh, the, the male desire can be rather aggressive. So there's always one man who's going to save her and that's usually a, a part played by Armando Bo himself or uh, by his son, Victor Bo. So uh, there was uh, also something um, crucial in the films of Armando Bo with Isabel Sarli was the spirit of a troupe. You had the feeling that it was always the same technicians. It was always Armando Bo playing, his son playing, Isabel Sarli. So they had this uh, really cohesion. And, and that's why the works, even though they belong to different genres, they are uh, still very coherent. And uh, there are other things, and this is just a parenthesis on Argentinian film history, is that Armando Bo was also a cinephile. So he worked with uh, celebrities from the classic era in Argentinian cinema. For example, for the comedies, if you saw uh, La Mujer del Zapatero earlier today, or if you see uh, La Señora del Intendente tomorrow, uh, those are the two comedies with Pepe Arias. Pepe Arias was a myth, so people saw him appearing on screen and they would laugh. And he and, and for those who saw the film today, you saw the difference between a, a major and confirmed actor, comic actor like Pepe Arias and, of course, Isabel Sarli, who um, had another register of, um, of acting. So um, Armando Bo continued uh, using many figures from what was called uh, uh, the, the golden age of Argentinian cinema. Argentinian cinema was the major industry in Latin America during the 1930s. It was the most important country, not only for film production, but also because of the influence it had in uh, all the Spanish-speaking countries, including Spain. So the, um, what happened is that during World War II, so starting 1940s, is when the... Uh, Argentinian industry decayed for economic reasons because they were neutral during the war, etc. So um, that's when uh, the cinema decayed. That was also the uh, beginning of the Peronist era. And that's when all the structures in cinema uh, lingered or continued to exist, but uh, the production went really down. But things such as censorship, such as studios, such as cameras still existed. So that was uh, pretty easy in a way for Armando Bo to uh, create a team of faithful people who would accompany him uh, all over the world because he uh, made films with Isabel Sarli in Panama, in Venezuela, in Brazil, in Paraguay, of course. And uh, they even made a film that was not directed by Armando Bo, but uh, as you saw in the documentary yesterday, in South Africa. So, uh, but Armando Bo was not only a man from another time, so coming from the cinema of the 1940s, but he was also a contemporary of what was called the new wave in Argentina, the first new Argentinian cinema. And uh, this generation of uh, filmmakers that were film critics too, very much like the French new wave or the European new waves, these people were, um, uh, I, were making films that had to resemble the European new wave, so very much influenced by Bergman, by Antonioni, by Forman, and um, Armando Bo decided to stay away from these new waves because he didn't want to make an European elitist cinema. He wanted to make popular films. So uh, what is interesting is that even though he refused to make uh, 
new wave films. It was the new wave directors who first um, defended him, and most especially Rodolfo Kuhn, who was a filmmaker, probably one of the most um, uh, Europeanized uh, filmmakers, who actually wrote the first book on Armando Bo, and who coined the term of naive porn for the films that Armando Bo uh, made with Isabel Sarli. So you had this opposition between elitist art and popular art within Argentinian cinema, and Armando Bo, even though making very popular films, was defended by the elite. But he's not only so coming from classic cinema, a contemporary and a friend of the new waves, but he also had a very deep cinephilia, and some of his films are also homages or responses to films such as, for example, Roger Vadim and God Created a Woman, and uh, Armando Bo made it two years after, and The Devil Created Men. So he's trying also to make his Brigitte Bardot uh, in, uh, with Isabel Sarli. And then he also responded to all the horror <laughs> films, or like um, he wanted to, resp to make a variation on Rosemary's Baby by Polanski, uh, and that that's Embrujada that some of you uh, saw yesterday. So adapting the whole question of the female desire of a child, uh, but translated into the Paraguayan jungle. So if um, some, I mean, one can say that um, Armando Bo always makes the same film, a woman by herself, surrounded by misogyny, by machism, by hypocrisy. Um, she is a very spectacular uh, character, and I think most of you have been impressed by Isabel Sarli's uh, stiffness and the fact that she represents this uh, frontal uh, female desire that uh, vindicates a new sexuality. So that's why she was uh, almost um, uh, subversive, even though she knew the limits of her acting. And of course, Armando Bo also knew the limits of her. She wasn't a great actress. We, we can say that uh, here, but um, she, he, he wrote the parts for her. And, and that's why the films are so surprising and so unique. The, um, the fact that Armando Bo, even though he was not a revolutionary filmmaker, was probably <laughs> one of the Argentinian filmmakers who had most trouble with the censorship. Every of his films, every film he made with Isabel Sarli was censored. It had to go through um, uh, cuts uh, ordered by civilians. People called saying, I feel offended by this film, by this woman, very much like the women and the village in the comedies. And also the government, the military regime, was um, very um, critical against the apparitions of Isabel Sarli. Isabel Sarli had been uh, Miss Argentina, the last Peronist Miss Argentina. She was right before Peron uh, was uh, forbidden and went into exile. The last beauty queen of Peron was uh, Isabel Sarli. So she always vindicated the fact that she was very close to the people and very close to the Peronist ideas. And that's why they were really um, followed in a way. And uh, Isabel Sarli says that they were even threatened by the military um, regime. The, um, the, the other critiques that were made against these films is that uh, some people took it as uh, sex exploitation, which I think it's true, uh, but it's very much a female figure resembling, and Armando Bo wanted to create this figures very much like in Federico Fellini's films, because they always triumph. They always know something that men don't know. She always uh, takes profit of men's uh, uh, libidinal forces, or they always are uh, ahead of, um, of men. She always wins, and uh, to some other feminist critics, this was very important because Isabel Sarli defended uh, desire. She, decided, she, she defended also what I would call lust for love because she was always looking for a strong couple 
not a family, not a social status. The material concerns were not hers. She was always in, in looking for uh, love, of course. In most of the films, this love was played by Armando Bo himself, who, as I said, appears in all the films. He even uh, he didn't let uh, all the other male actors touch Isabel Sarli. He was the only one kissing her, touching her. So you see, this. what is interesting also is that he was presenting this character of free-spirited woman, but he was the macho in the set. So that's, that's also some of the contradictions of Armando Bo, uh, which make him also a man of his times and his culture. Um, the, the, the films, as you saw today, for the, the ones who went to the Paraguayan jungle, begin with this touch of exotism, going to well, Paraguay, going to Panama, going to Venezuela, sounded exotic for such a European city as Buenos Aires. And then from this exotism, it moved to a pretty self-referenced cinema. That means Armando Bo started using some of his old films for uh, recreating situations or flashbacks. He also started using his um, footage, family footage, because he was the romantic partner of Isabel Sarli, which was also a part of the scandal in Argentina because they never got married. Armando Bo, again, one of his contradictions, he never divorced his uh, wife, and but was everywhere showing with Isabel Sarli. So, um, uh, and they started using every single material of their personal life, very much like uh, Godard, you know, transcribing all the dialogues and trying to use their everyday life into film. And this is possible because Armando Bo controlled every single moment in the creative process. He produced the films, he wrote the films, he plays in the films, or takes the cheapest actor, his own son, uh, and, um, of course, not getting paid. He does the editing, he also does the music under a, a, a pseudonym, and he, uh, of course, uh, is always there defending the films, sometimes by beating the journalists, but he is very, very present. And that is why also for the new generations, he became an economic model, because it was a domestic economy. Uh, producers left him more and more. People didn't want to make the same film over and over. And he was very much like a pioneer in, in a sort of John Cassavetes, Gina Rowland's uh, moment because it was uh, always the same place, the same friends, the same crew. And um, that's why also many contemporary filmmakers uh, are rediscovering Armando Bo because saying he financed his films this way, in a very simple way, very modest way, so why not? He wanted to make films with a woman he loved and by showing her, he will do it. So that's a kind of idealistic uh, uh, vision, I know, but it's, it's also to show you why Armando Bo has such an importance uh, for a whole generation and that he's being now uh, rediscovered. Of course, we can think that he comes from a camp aesthetic that the pleasure we take in watching the films, it's because of their bad taste or uh, because we have an irony uh, and we can laugh and we say that's so awful, but these films are um, really lively, really audacious. And uh, Bo was known as a very lonely, stubborn, and, and, and really uncompromising director. He always wanted, he had an idea and he was going to defend it. And he wanted to create a free-spirited sex symbol, which I think he uh, did. Uh, for those who are discovering the films uh, tonight, I hope you, you enjoy Fiebre because it's really one of the most hardcore films he made. And um, just to say if, uh, one thing about uh, Fiebre to finish with is that maybe the only thing I should tell you about it is that Armando Bo uh, said that he wanted, uh, he, uh, he made this film inspired by a real story. So I'll let you see what the real story is. Um, and 
once at, before dying, so they made the films from 1956 until 1980, uh, right before Armando Bo passed away. Uh, Armando Bo said, quoting, and he knew he was quoting the Cuban revolutionaries, he said, he said, my films may be bad, but they're mine. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much and enjoy Fiebre.